Welcome to this webinar. It's a masterclass on scaling up CSA. So it's machinery, site design, irrigation and tools. And it's being led by Amy Willoughby from Clockgate CSA in Somerset and Tom O'Kane from Kaitan CSA on the Gower. I'm Susie Russell, the coordinator of the UK Community Supported Agriculture Network. And I'll leave you in Tom and Amy's capable hands. Thanks a lot, Susie. Yeah, hello everyone. Nice to nice to meet you all and hear a bit about you. I was getting sidetracked then actually while you were talking because one of my kids was ill in school and needs to get home. <laughs> but actually it's it's sorted now. They managed to work it out. Um so yeah, it's nice um to be back. Me and Amy have done this particular webinar before. So hopefully it'll be even better this time and useful for you. Um I've got a couple of things I was going to start off and sort of just outline how we've scaled up and how we work. And I've got a couple of short films I was going to show you. Um, but before that, I also wanted to show you briefly um, a crop planning tool, which I've been using at the moment with some other CSAs that we're supporting. I think I can screen share, can't I? Yeah. So, um, so, um, oh, actually, before I say that, I should say a little bit about our project and what we do at Kaitan. So, um, we are growing for 130 households. We're based on a nine acre site, but actually of that nine acres, we grow on about five to six acres. Um, we do schools work. So we're like engaging schools and similar to, I know one of you was talking about trying to engage like poorer communities, Hannah, I think it was. We, we're kind of quite similar that Swansea is split very clearly east-west divide with the wealth in the west and the poverty in the east and um, we, we really trying to engage that side of Swansea in this kind of work so the ways we're going about that is we've had a schools project sustainable schools growing program that we run with five schools in Swansea east that we've been doing for the last five six years and um, we're also now in the process of setting up or supporting one of our members to set up a CSA sort of right in the heart of Swansea East. We're kind of still waiting on a contract for the land, but it looks like it's all going ahead. But that's something we're definitely really interested in. Um, so we do that. So we do the core CSA growing for our members and then we do the educational work with schools and then we host trainees and volunteers. So we sort of train up people every year and we've gone on to help them set up their own CSAs locally. And then partly on the grounds of that, this year I've started up an online grow your own CSA training. So we've got, actually we've got Hetty online who's doing the training with us. Um, so we've got 15 people from across the UK and we meet online three times a month and then people get kind of homework in between. And the idea, hey, Hetty, the idea is to guide people through the process through the winter period of how to sort of put all the basics in place for setting up their CSA. Um, so having said all that, I'll start on my scaling up. So we started as um, a CSA of 50 households. And actually in the first year we were just growing on an acre. So we started up by growing um, for those 50 households, just the high value produce. And we were buying in the lower value produce. Like we started by buying in potatoes, onions, carrots, um, parsnips, all that stuff that we could basically get from an organic wholesaler and would be, yeah, would, would make it sort of financially viable for us to set up on a small scale. And then basically over the years, we've taken on more land. So probably by the third year, we were up to about 90 to 100 households and we were growing the vast majority of the produce for that. And now in our seventh season, we are up to 130 households and we grow pretty much everything. Um, but we we buy in through the hungry gap, probably about for like about two months of the year, 50 percent of our share is probably bought in. That's a rough guess. So. What I'm going to do, I'll just show you, as you can see my screen, if you were to go online, actually, I can't see my top bar. How do I move that? Oh, there. So basically, if you went online and you put in a search for um, CSA cropping tool, and this is basically a tool which was developed by Ben Raskin at the Soil Association, 
And the link to it is from the CSA network website. Um, and it's something that I hadn't used much until recently with, um, with groups helping them crop planning, but I think it's a really useful tool when you're starting up. I've actually, it's, it's being very slow to connect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump onto the copy of R1, which basically this is what you'll come to when you, when you click that link from the CSA network website, you get to this cropping tool, which is a spreadsheet, which is basically at the top of it, you've got this box here, which is number of people per year. So you can put your number of people into that. So for instance, um, the lady who's got two people on her CSA. So instead of 90, this is like equivalent large shares. So I've set this spreadsheet up for Kaitan. And even though we're 130 households, we're in effect the equivalent of 90 full shares, I would say. So what you've got, yeah, let's, let's leave it as it is for now, but you can basically adjust all of these boxes. So if you wanted to find out, okay, I'm going to do a CSA with 90 full shares. That could be anything. That could be 10 full shares. And then you basically run through your crops, which are down below here. And again, you can adjust any of these numbers. You can click on any of these boxes. So I've decided that onions, we will supply our members um, roughly a kilo per week and we'll give them... Um, 30 weeks of the year, we will supply them with onions. So that means you, we're going to need 2,700 and um, the price per unit, which the, is adjusted every year via the Soil Association, they, they adjust this, this spreadsheet every year. So that will then give you like a total crop value. It tells you which part of the rotation those onions are going in. And then lastly, over here, it gives you the area you will need to grow those onions. So you can basically go on, download this and have a little play around with it. But what I found is just got someone coming in the door. So I'm gonna put my headphones on. So can you hear me still okay? So um, yeah, basically you scroll down this spreadsheet and you can see that there's all the different crops there. Um, all the different values, all the area it's going to take to grow each crop. And then what you come to at the end is a total crop value of the year, which will give you like a rough estimate of the kind of income you're going to get from shares. And then it will also give you, this is 1.18 hectares. So it's saying that we need like 1.18 hectares in order to grow all of that. Um, and yeah, it's got also fertility building, it's got a small percentage in there for crop failure, and then it's got the total area of site you're likely to need to include all the infrastructure. And what I've, I'm happy to send this on to you, because what I've gone on to do then is add in all the elements of this crop plan that aren't there. So basically, there's a lot of crops I found weren't included in it, which actually have quite a high value in themselves. So actually, we've got an overall crop value of 66, 67,000, which is interesting actually. That's, I think this is really quite accurate because we have, we have a, we generate 65,000 a year. So it's quite interesting to see that this is, um, this, this crop plan actually works pretty well. So I won't say more than that, but I'd say definitely go and have a look at that cropping tool, download it from the CSA network site and just have a play around with it. Cause I think it's a really useful tool just to sort of um, give you an idea of what kind of area you need to produce on, what kind of quantities of different crops and all that kind of thing. So I'm then going to move on to show you some of these video videos, um, which I have basically put them together for the CSA online training course that we're doing. So I'm just going to show you parts of them, not the full videos, but the first one is just going to show you eight minutes. And this one is where I'm um, looking at what scale a CSA should be. I'm hoping it's going to all, oh, there you go.
I can't hear you, Tom. Oh. Oh, hang on. It's because I've plugged in. There you go. Let me try. Program, which is how to grow your own CSA. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about scale. What kind of scale you should be looking to set your CSA up. And depending on that scale, what kind of tools you're going to need. There's a number of considerations when you're looking at scale. Um, it really depends uh, what kind of community group, what kind of size of community you're looking to feed, how much land you have access to, how many growers you are, whether it's a full-time or a part-time income you're looking to generate from that land. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of considerations. And after I give a brief background on how Kaitan works, I'm going to interview a number of other CSAs from across the UK, all different scales, different ways of working, just to give you a bit of a cross section of other ways of working. Um, so we currently grow for 130 households and we do that on seven acres. We actually have nine acres, but I'd say two of those acres are devoted to wildlife, ponds, scrubland, willow, um, yeah, just wild areas, which is really valuable in itself. So that's worth considering planning into your CSA. When we started up, my general, my understanding from chatting to other CSAs, that was to have a financially viable project, you needed to have about 70 or 80 equivalent full shares. So, you know, that might be made up of uh, more small shares, but overall, if you have 60, 70, 80, um, you know, it kind of ranged in that area when I was discussing with people, um, equivalent full-time shares, it should be a financially viable project, obviously, depending on how it's managed and how well it's managed. Um, so within that area, we're growing for those 130 households, we're trying to supply all year round. We do buy in for the hungry gap for a short period, but that's quite a limited small amount of produce we have to buy in. The vast majority of our produce, I'd say 90, 95% of it comes from, for 12 months of the year, comes from these polytunnels and the field scale growing. Um, our polytunnels, which you can see, this is one. They're all actually secondhand polytunnels apart from this one. We have four of these, which are approximately seven to eight meters wide. They all, all vary a bit and about 25 to 30 meters long, each of them. Um, so we're using those, those are packed all year round. We use them very efficiently and we, we keep, keep stuff in the ground and coming out of the tunnels constantly 12 months of the year. Um, and then our outside crops, I can show you briefly around, actually I'll blast around the polytunnels and then I'll take a blast around the main, the two main sites just to show you our different sites. And then I'm going to show you our tool shed, what tools we have and also just run through the machinery we have as well. So moving on to tools, I'm just going to show you what hand tools we've got, and then I'll show you briefly around the machinery that we're using. So bearing in mind that we work with a lot of volunteers. So yeah, spades, shovels, forks, lots of hoes, uh, wheel hoe, post hole digger, uh, broad fork, and then, you know, just general hand tools. And then we've got a few cedars up there as well. I've actually got the Jang cedar. We use mostly a little handheld uh, wolf cedar, which I can't see there. That is around somewhere. And um, the old earthway cedar that we don't use so much anymore. Sometimes use it for parsnips. And this earthway, another earthway cedar, which we use for sowing green manure crops. I'm just going to show you briefly what kind of machinery we're using at the moment. First up is my dad's old 1961 Massey 35. 
which is the sort of powerhouse of everything on the farm. We've got a little locking lid trailer, which is pretty essential for harvest every week. We can keep stuff cool in there, pile loads more on top. Potato ridger, potato weeder. These are things I've just picked up in from, from local farms. Transport box, really useful for everything and anything, moving things around the farm. Steerage hoe, which we've just picked up recently. I'm really looking forward to using that this year. Save a lot of hoeing, hopefully. Little rotavator, one of the first bits of kit we had, which we don't use so much now as we've got the power harrow, but still very useful for certain jobs. The potato planter, it's an old planter that was donated by Coca CSA in West Wales. We just did a little bit of work on it and that's working really nicely. We've then got the flail mower, which is one of the few bits of kit we bought new, and that's essential for us for flailing in old crops and green manures. We've got a power harrow, which, like I said, we use that a lot more now than the rotavator. It's gentler on the ground, does a really nice job, leaves a good bed for planting behind. Got our potato lifter. It's one of the old chain ones. Um, found this in a barn locally, so got it pretty cheaply. The, one of the problems you have with it is these bars in here breaking, but we've got lots of spare ones with it and just doing an acre, it's fine. It's doing the job. It's doing the job for us. We've got an old topper there, which is good for just really rough bits of ground, hacking rough bits of ground, a bit broken up. We could do with a bit of a repair, but it still works fine. And then a little chain harrow, which we mostly use for harrowing in all our green manure seed, uh, really effective. Personally, I, I really rate these tractors. You can get all the spare parts for them. Um, they do everything you need to do on this scale. I guess that's the largest bit of work it does is pulling up the muck spreader, um, which is something new we've got this year, which saves us a lot of time and effort. And then we've got uh, another a Massey 35, a 35X, and it's really handy to have the two so we can sometimes work two of us at the same time. And if there is a problem with either of the tractors, then we've always got one working. I'm now going to hand you over firstly to Abby Mason from Big Meadow Seed. So that's a bit of a, I've kind of knocked together a few bits of video there, but that's um, just to give you a, a general idea of our tools and scale. Although I didn't go around the main site there, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of the um, what we're working with. And then I was going to show you um, another sections of another video, which is about planning your CSA site layout. But there was particular elements of that, which again, I think are useful to give you a kind of feeling of scale and um, yeah, the scale we're working on and how we've scaled up. Because I think um, what you'll see the difference between us and Amy, um, well, there's lots of differences, but one of the main things is our, the, the fact that we're more machinery based. Um, and slightly larger sort of land scale area. Um, but yeah, I'll show you parts of this video. So um, just going to start with this one. Hello, this is Tom O'Kane from Kaitan CSA. I'm making this video as one of our resources for our Grow Your Own CSA training program. And this particular video is going to be about site planning. So I had a scout around on the internet and I didn't find anything that was kind of relevant enough to the program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through how we laid out our sites, just as an example, by no means um, you know, we're like the perfect site layout. I'm sure there's people out there who could tell you all sorts of other ideas of site layout in a lot more detail. But I thought just giving you an example of how we concluded our site layout would um, give a kind of starting position to, to discuss and think about how you're going to go ahead with your sites. So... In considering your site layout, the, the issues that we have considered 
the main issues that we considered, I'd say, are these. Access to water, aspect and shade, prevailing winds and spring winds, building positions, barns, packing sheds, polytunnels, toilets, tool storage, parking, covered workspace for sun and rain, wild areas, play, relaxation areas, drainage, views, roads and neighbours, and lastly, permaculture zoning, which I know little, I do know a little about. Um, I can't say we've applied it in any great detail on our sites, but that could be very relevant for some sites. I'd also say within considering all these different aspects of your site, ultimately, you're going to go with what feels right. I know for us, there were certain things that, you know, when I walked onto the site, I just felt like, ah, oh, this needs to go there, that needs to go there. If you sort of break it down logically, uh, maybe it's not the best position to put a barn or, uh, or or whatever it is, but actually it just feels right. And there might be some areas that you've got to walk further to get to it. And actually, but when you're there, if that's your main hanging out space it's, and it's got a beautiful view, um, I'd probably go for that one rather than the other one. So our two sites are very different. This is our original site down here that we call Webb's Field, which is a four acre field. Um, it, there's very different geology under the two sites. It's hard to see from this, but basically this very green land up here and running around the edge of these trees is, is actually quite a lot higher than the ground down in the valley here. And this is common, common land. There's a thousand acres of common land across here and sort of running north and east and west. That basically is old um, runoff from glaciers. So it's kind of a mixture of kind of boulder clays and all sorts of random bits of rocks, but there's lots of clay in there. And what's happened thousands of years ago is that clay has kind of settled down and run down these valleys, um, right down to the coast, actually. On the coast, you get, you get cliffs full of kind of scree and clay. Um, so what it means for this site is that actually it's a very heavy clay. The top soil is pretty nice for about a state spade's depth, but then the rest of the soil is very, very heavy clay. And it means that the, the upper part of the site here, which is fairly flat, is very waterlogged. This sloping element of the field is, um, is fairly free draining. And then the bottom of the field is incredibly wet. And you'll see, I'll show you the video afterwards. We'll walk around the site, but actually we've created wetland and wild areas in the particularly wet parts of the field. And then about six fields over is our newest site, which is Furs Hill. This is owned by the Ecological Land Co-op. There's actually 18 acres here, which is owned by the Ecological Land Co-op. And we rent these five acres, just that, that section there. I'm just going to pause it there just to show um, I'm going to skip on to oh, actually saying that we'll carry on a little bit further. And um, even though as the crow flies, it's pretty close. When we're going back and forth with machinery, we tend to have to go all the way around here, either around this way or up this little tiny old lane here and back around there. So. It, there's quite a different distance between the sites, which isn't ideal, but it's just what we've ended up with. Um, but in some ways, I really value the difference in the two sites. This site is incredibly beautiful, surrounded by ancient oak, wood, oak woodland and, and all sorts of mixed, mixed um, broadleaf forest. And this site is much more of a, a working site, really, like we use every inch of the ground, we're working towards uh, transforming it to an agroforestry system at some point with getting in a lot more trees and windbreaks. But this ground, like I said, this whole area here is very good, good growing ground. It's so right. I am going to skip on there because actually um, this video has got a lot more information in it than we necessarily need for this. So I'm going to go on to seven minutes about that so this is more about the individual field layouts here 
So starting with our original site, this isn't an up-to-date photo. Uh, this is just something I took off Google Maps. So um, it's just to give you an idea of how we have laid out the site. North is pretty much kind of that way up there. Um, so this is fairly sort of south facing and it slopes this area here slopes to the west. This area is fairly flat and this area is fairly flat. Um, we chose to put all our polytunnels up the top here. There's actually now four polytunnels and a fifth one going in this autumn winter. We chose that site because it was flat and we wanted them also away from the road. There's a, there's a road that runs into the village down here. And we basically, when you look up from the main road through the gate at the bottom, you basically only see the first polytunnel on each side. So even though we've got five polytunnels, you have the impression looking in that there's only two there, um, which they have to get planning permission. But um, I think that was a lot that that was on our side, basically, that really helped that the visual impact wasn't too great. Then we decided we undernard actually between running our beds down the field or or across the field. And in the end, we opted for across the fields, partly for visual impact. Um, and partly because we didn't want it to drain off too quick. But actually, having worked there a few years, I don't know whether we would have been better off running our beds down the field. So in very wet periods of the year, the water would run away. But it's tricky on this site, because what we find is this slope actually dries out very quickly in a dry period, even though it can be incredibly waterlogged. It's a difficult field to farm. This, this field, as you can see in this photo, this was during a very dry period. Um, the ground does really dry out. And when, when it dries, the water drains to the bottom of the field down to now where we have a pond and willow beds. Um, the top stays fairly damp. That was another reason for having the polytunnels here, that actually it's, it's fairly minimal, our irrigation in the polytunnels. We have, if anything, we've um we put gutters in so we've got drains running down the side of these tunnels some down both sides some down one side um down all of them and then into a main drain which runs out and into a into a gutter in the hedge here so um yeah that's our that's our main main sort of layout you can't see but we've got a packing shed up here parking area down this area and a compost toilet under the trees here and in i guess in um we you know we had thought ideally because our parking area is down here it probably would have been good to have polytunnels packing shed uh toilet everything sort of fairly close down this end to the parking area but from up the top here um well, for one thing, it was actually far too wet to put our polytunnels or a barn down there. So we opted for the top area, which is drier, even though it's still not particularly dry. Um, and as we had our polytunnels here, we thought we'd rather have our packing shed there. Um, it means that basically we've got to bring the vehicle right into the top of the field, which is difficult in wet periods. And during really wet periods, we have to barrow produce down to the bottom. But we've kind of got used to it. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's also a really beautiful view from here out across the valley. So if we were sitting down here for all our tea breaks, you know, we wouldn't enjoy the site so much. So we so we opted to come up the top here. Um, I'll show you some pictures as well of this site in in sort of full production at the moment, because the site layer has changed quite a bit since we've got the pond installed and new polytunnel up and everything. Um, compost toilet we chose to put down in this corner again for like minimum visual impact and sort of privacy uh rotations our pond in the wet area willow beds in the wet area we're extending the willow beds right through this wet area of the field and we've now sort of opted for just a summer rotation in this field because it's a fairly fairly wet ground like i said and we don't really want to be on the ground in winter we've got summer brassicas green manures 
um, squash and sweet corn, and we we rotate that lot around, which you'll see that from the picture, the more recent picture I'll show you afterwards. Um, prevailing winds generally come from south, southwest, blowing across this way. We're lucky that along this end, uh, we there's a fairly steep hillside, wooded hillside, so it's actually an incredibly sheltered site. So um, prevailing wind isn't too much of an issue. But what we did notice, particularly in the early years, is that these north northerly and northwesterly winds often blow in in the early spring when we've got delicate young plants planted out. So that's where we're thinking about. So we have kind of allowed this hedgerow to flourish and we've, we've built it up. We've planted all sorts of um, particularly pollinating plants all along this end of the field just to build up this bank. And so early in the year, we get as much growth as we possibly can to, to break down that cold wind coming in, coming in to, to sort of damage the early crops. Um, so I think tool storage we've got in the sheds here. So all our tools are in a, actually a tiny little shed, which is probably about two meters by one meter. And all our tools fit fairly easily in there. All the machinery is actually in the other side. Any machinery we need to use, we bring down to use in this field. Parking, like I mentioned, is down the bottom of the field to keep people, um, keep vehicles out the way of the site, really. And then covered workspace, sun and rain. We use an area of the polytunnel here, which we keep for hanging out in wet weather and working in wet weather. And there's enough space in there to get school groups in, which I'll so show you some pictures of as well. And then in warm weather, we're generally under these huge oak trees, this one in particular, which um, offers really lovely shade for packing. And our shed, which is under there, also has like a big shade area for packing. And wild areas, basically all of this, we've let go wild. There's a number of ponds in here. All of this, we kind of letting go wild. And then we've got willow beds and all the exteriors of the field were letting go wild. Though this site has a lot more wild area, which is, which is really lovely. It brings a lot of diversity to the site, a lot of wildlife. Um, and, you know, we haven't seen any negatives to that really. Um, you know, the odd squirrel coming in and stealing strawberries, but we kind of not too bothered by that. Um, play and relaxation, you know, it's great for kids. We've got a track that runs here into the woods and kids go off and disappear in the woods and play. Um, we've got a load of dirt jumps down here. So my boy and all his mates race their bikes down here and they've got about six jumps progressively getting bigger and bigger down the field. There's talk of setting up a half pipe for skating that someone might donate us in the field here. Um, so yeah, you know, there's a lot of scope for, for fun in this field and engaging people. And I'd say um, drainage has been an issue. So like I said, we've drained this whole area where the polytunnels are. We've got quite serious drainage on it, taking water out. And we do find this portion of the field, which is fairly flat, gets very waterlogged from water that gets through our drainage system into the top of the field. So we're considering this winter, putting in a big ditch and bank along here and draining this salt section away. Um, I think I've touched on views from roads and neighbours. We did have a lot of issues with the neighbours when we set up this site for various historical reasons with the site. Um, so we've been very wary we keep, we've planted actually a tree boundary along the road down here, which so for most of the year, actually, you don't really see into the field, so it doesn't bother anyone. Um, I'm not quite sure why people are so bothered about seeing a field of vegetables anyway, but they do seem to dislike it, some people. Um, but so basically, our visual impact is minimised. Like I said, the polytunnels, you only see two, and that's kind of from the side on, you see this whole sweep of landscape before the polytunnels, so they have very little impact. We did have to go down the route of getting permitted development because we're on a 15-acre um, site, so we've got rights for permitted development. And I think that's about it for this site. I'll move... Just going to then... I've got one last little bit of this video, <clears throat> which is um, 
what is it? It's 12 minutes long. So I'm going to skip on to that. And then um, let me just check what was that? That was like. So this is just to show you how the other site is laid out. How and why we've laid out our sites, why we have. So this is our second site. In a sense, it's a five acre site, whereas the other one is four acres. This site is much more production, much more of a productive site for us. Um, our area of the site, basically, like I showed you earlier, there's an 18 acre site owned by the Ecological Land Co-op, which is all this area. We have this five acre plot. And then we actually sublet this area, which is about only about a quarter of an acre to Francesca. She has the polytunnel and this area and she grows salads and greens for local businesses. And then I'd say a lot of our production for our 130 households, a lot of the, the bulk of the produce we grow comes out of this area of sort of four and a half acres or so. Um, yeah, you can see we've got a five year rotation. So we've got, um, I always think of it starting with potatoes, followed by uh, brassicas, followed by onions and leeks, followed by roots and friends, followed by a year of fertility building. And I'll show you again, a more recent photo of this, which shows the, the site in sort of full summer production. This was taken earlier this winter. And you can see a bit more of the, the shape of the landscape from here. Um, again, that's north, that's kind of looking fairly north. This is like our thousand acres of common land runs around that area. And this whole area is like a raised up plateau, which runs around there. And the other field, which we just looked at, Webb's field down in Ilston, is actually down behind, is probably about 50, I don't know, 50, 80 meter drop behind those trees down into the valley to where the other field is situated. So um, looking at how we, chose to lay out this site. One thing I didn't say actually, which I should say about the other site is our polytunnels. We've orientated, we've orientated them all um, fairly north south. We've obviously gone with the hedge boundary to sort of help, but north is kind of up this direction. So they've gone fairly north south. So when the sun comes over, you get the full spread of the sun running up the tunnel. Whereas if your tunnel was running across east west, if you had tall plants growing in one side of it, you'd lose a lot of the sun sunlight onto crops at the back, on crops at the back. Um, so what to say about this one? Obviously the main road runs up here. So when we started with the site, we decided to put polytunnel just inside the gate for easy access, for checking watering and whatnot, which is a relief after the other site where you've got a long walk uphill every time you come to check watering. Then we tuck the barn in behind the polytunnel just because we wanted to minimize the area that was actually built on because our plan for this site was to have as much growth area with as little interference from parking and buildings as possible. Um, it's all very level. It's all good soil. It's all really well draining. This area raises up a bit more. There's a bit of a limestone sinkhole there, um, which means that this is the only part of the site which does dry out a bit. We've put an orchard in this area. We do plan to break this field up into blocks in a kind of agroforestry system. We're sort of working towards doing that with someone, hopefully, this winter. So access to water. Again, I didn't mention on the other site, but both sites have mains water. So when we came, there was a mains water pipe here, which um we've now we've laid pipe all the way along to the polytunnel and then we've got like and across here into the neighbor site trevor and bettina that is an issue that actually we haven't got enough pressure between the two sites so we're looking at having a second and possibly even thirds main connections to to increase the pressure so then once we'd run our main water pipe along the edge of the field we've got stem pipes like here here here, here. So basically for each rotational block, we have a sand standpipe and the last one will run to the polytunnel and to this area here. And 
we've also put one in which runs across here, standpipe there, and then Trevor and Patina have their own standpipes in the field next door. So we basically run water to every area of the site, and then we have enough hose and irrigation pipe to run from any one of those to the end of any of the beds in the in the entire site, so we can get water everywhere. Um, aspect and shade. So the shade isn't really an issue in this site. I'm going to quickly drop back to the other site because I realise I didn't say that there. But actually, one thing we did find in Webfield was with this woodland around the back, we do in winter and early spring, we lose um, we lose sunlight. The sunlight comes slowly onto this part of the field. So actually, that's part of the reason why we positioned the polytunnels out so far from the trees, so that they weren't in the shade for too much in the morning. So if we had um, crops freezing up in the tunnels in winter, they wouldn't have to sit frozen right into mid-morning, midday. They'll defrost very quickly once the sun comes out. Um, aspect again in this field, we've got full sun running across pretty much south, running up all the beds every day. So yeah, that was one of the reasons why we've laid it out, everything in that direction. So jumping back over to Furs Hill, we've actually gone for beds running the other way. The sun is sort of passing over here. And, um, you know, in theory, if we'd gone with the how we'd done it at the other site, we would have run our beds all down this way. But I kind of just felt like it fitted the field and the site better. If we were to run them that way, we, there would have been extremely long beds, or we would have had to do blocks of beds, which actually, in retrospect, now looking back, probably would have worked really well with a kind of agroforestry system, which we're now considering moving over to. Um, we could have had, you know, blocks of trees and shelter, and then beds running, shorter beds running between each of those blocks down the field. If I was coming back to this field now, it's probably how I'd think about designing it. But we've gone with it how it is, and I think we're now going to continue to develop it how it is. Prevailing winds and spring winds, Again, similar to the other field, we have very cold spring winds blowing in from the north here. But these, a lot of the crops here, we plant later, like it's more um, of our summer, autumn, winter crops grown in this field. So we don't do very delicate early sowings in this field. So we're not really worried about the exposure. Prevailing winds blow sort of straight up here. Polytunnel's fine, barn is fine. They're protected by the two hedgerows. And generally, you know, we don't have an issue with um, with the prevailing winds on the site. We do nothing. Nothing is really particularly bothered by them. Um, tool store is all in this barn. I'll go and show you around in a minute. Uh, parking is just this area here. It does get a bit congested sometimes, and sometimes people park out on the road here, um, which isn't ideal for villages and buses passing. But sometimes if it gets really busy. We have to put a few cars out there, but we have got enough space to squeeze quite a few cars in the site. Covered workspace for sun and rain. We've got the barn in wet weather, we can go in there and pack, but we're also going to build a lean to on the barn because what we find is in very hot weather, we kind of, we've got a little umbrella we go under for tea breaks, but we haven't got very good packing space in very hot weather. The barn is okay but it gets kind of stuffy in there. So I definitely recommend a sort of indoor outdoor space with walls, with no walls and a roof where you can get under when it's very hot for like just chilling out and for packing. Um, wild areas, this, that's one issue with this field. You know, we use every bit of it. We have let the hedges grow in and grow wilder than they were previously. We've got this area of sort of fairly wild area with an orchard, but that's why we want to bring in this sort of more of an agroforestry style system to build up the wild areas. Oh, sorry about that. Just going to put that back. To build up the wild areas within the field. Um, play and relaxation. Again, there's not so much play and relaxation. It's a pretty feels like much more like a sort of busy work site when you're here. Uh, when we are relaxing, it's generally in this area. And we have, if we have schools to come to visit. 
they'll generally gather on this big lawn area here. So that's really nice to keep, you know, kind of a big green lawn area where people can park up and camp as well if they want. Um, and yeah, school groups can come and hang out. Drainage, not an issue at all on this site. Um, it's a little bit wet down this area, but currently we're not doing, we've subsoiled actually. We did subsoil the field, particularly this area last year to try and counteract that sort of wet patch. So we'll kind of just see how that gets on. It's interesting, you can see it actually in the picture. This is a much darker green and actually where the wet area is just down here, the crops are more more yellowing. That's actually a, a winter green manure crop that's left over before being turned in for roots. But you can see it hasn't grown so well down that area of the field. Views, roads, neighbours. Um, views from the road, people basically look in and they see Francesca's beautiful salad patch. So that's a bonus to have that in the gate, lots of flowers and colourful salads. Um, People barely see the barns and the polytunnel now, the hedge grows up. They see it more in winter, but not much at this time of year. Um, neighbours, there's very few neighbours actually looking onto the site, so I don't think anyone's particularly bothered about what we're doing. Um, there, are, there are planning applications in for low impact dwellings in here and in here, which, yeah, neighbours are much more bothered about. But even that, I don't think will have a huge visual impact. Um, Permaculture zoning, again, worth looking into. We haven't really taken that into consideration on developing this site, but something I would definitely recommend looking at. So I'm going to... Sh right, so that, that's it, actually. So that was just to give you a... Um, I'm just going to stop the share. So that was just to give you an overall picture of the scale that we're at and, um, yeah, how we're working at the moment. So I think the plan is... I don't think we'll stop for questions. Will we go straight over to Amy and then we'll have questions at the end? Great, there you go. Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. Um, that's great. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Willoughby. So um, I'm part of the team that run Plotgate CSA or Plotgate Community Farm, as we now call ourselves. Um, we're based down near Glastonbury in Somerset. Um, uh, again, we're on, we're on very heavy clay soil, um, so that's that's definitely been a consideration. I'm sorry, I'm I'm very white. I'm aware that I'm very white, but I don't know if there's an awful lot I can do about it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share my screen and just run through um, a sort of presentation that uh, and show you some pictures of the site and talk about our site design. Okay. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Oops, there we go. All right, let me just get this start screen share screen. So hopefully you can now see an aerial picture of uh, Plotgate Community Farm. Um, so the main difference is we're, we're a very similar scale to K-Tan uh, actually in that um, we have probably about 120 household members. We also offer fortnightly boxes so that, that works out as about 90 um, full box equivalents every week. Um, so yeah, similar sort of scale. Um, we, we buy in uh, staples, so that would be um, potatoes, carrots and onions for six months of the year. Um, that's always how we plan it. it. It doesn't always work out like that. Sometimes we keep going longer with some things. Um, but our kind of financial planning is always and our crop planning is always about buying in potatoes, carrots, onions for between January and June. And the main reason for that is that we're hand cultivated. So we don't have um, we don't use tractors. We do use we do have a tractor and we use it for moving uh, manures and compost materials around the site. Um, but in terms of the cultivation, it's all hand cultivated. So the gardens are about three acres in total. Um, you can see them here. Um, so just to orient you, we're looking north. So we're looking north down the gardens. Um, 
uh, and the gardens are on a slight uh, west facing slope. So you can see quite clearly why we've decided to put the gardens into that, uh, the eastern part of that field. Um, when we first moved onto the land, we had this sense that this field was actually just a north facing, a slight north facing slope. And actually it was um, doing some careful contouring and we borrowed a laser, laser level for a week. And um, it was like, oh, actually this, this whole area faces west, it's a better orientation. So that was a great thing to do. Um, so the main, the main drivers in terms of site design for us um, have really been uh, water, water movement, water management. Um, the other thing to say about our site is that we're totally off grid. We don't have mains water connection. Um, and so, and we're also on the heavy clay. So being able to move water around the site um, and being able to manage water really effectively has been a massive design driver in our site. Um, and also the fact we're hand cultivated, we've tried to make the site as accessible as possible for people with wheelbarrows um, if you're in a big tractor, you can you can uh, uh, work your way across most things. So there is a lot of hard track down, and the track has also been designed specifically to to minimise this the slope. It's it's a very consistent gentle gradient down through the gardens. So here we are, this lovely aerial photograph that, um, in fact, someone from the CSA network came and took last year, which is lovely and gives you a sense of. Um, what we are. We also have livestock, so um, our whole site is 10 acres and we have sheep, we have Shetland sheep, and we have pigs and we have some chickens as well. Um, but the main CSA part of what we do is the veg. Um, right, so we'll move on. Okay, here we are. Um, yeah, so like I said, when we first moved on to the site, we, we, did, we made a contour map, we borrowed a laser level off a friend and we spent a week a weekend um, fiddling about this laser level and marking out the contours. So this little map on the right that I've put upside down so that it matches the, the photograph. So um, you can see the pond isn't on here. We had slightly different ideas about how the field would be used back in 2013 when we produced this map. Um, but yeah, but the contouring really gave us a sense of where we felt like the gardens needed to be on that slight west facing slope. Um, and you can see here that one of the first things that we put in was track as well. And so the track, uh, it, it was about creating a very, very even gradient down through the gardens. And this track becoming the kind of spine down through the gardens um, through which we could access, access all areas. Um, and that's how the, de the designs kind of continued as well. Um, so, yeah, and the first garden that we put in, so we, we have a kind of, we, we talk about our growing space as gardens. Um, and the first garden that we put in is this yellow square here on the map on the right, which is this sort of garden here that is surrounded by um, trees. So the shelter belt went in there quite early. Um, and yeah, and we still operate a garden system. So um, that area there is half an acre. Uh, and it's roughly a kilometre of beds. So it's, it's 20, 50 metre beds on, on, in that garden. And the rest of the gardens are either equivalent or they're half the area. So we have a nine year rotation, uh, two rotations in this garden, two rotations in this garden, two, two, and then a single one in this little triangle at the back. Um, we, uh, yeah, the, 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 the garden plan sort of came together before we were seriously thinking about the rotation. So we have had to um, extend other gardens to try and make the blocks roughly equivalent because we're not, we're not working in strict, a strict kind of block pattern. Um, so it has perhaps been a little bit more tricky to sort of fit in, uh, to, work, to work with a kind of strict rotation. Um, and you can see that we've got five polytunnels here. Um, and there's a four year rotation in the tunnels. Um, these two are one rotation, these two are one, and the big, the big tunnel, we have two rotations in there. So where are we now? Yeah, so you, the use of wheelbarrow, his down and his wheelbarrow up and down the tracks, uh, keeping it nice and easy for him. Um, 
Yeah, so like I said, one of, one of the big considerations was water. And what we observed when we first moved onto the site was that the water came down um, through this gateway. There's a, there's a ditch, there's a ditch in this uh, hedge line here. Um, and it basically just ran kind of like a river straight down into the hedge line and then down onto the levels which is where our land ends. And so we really wanted through the through the site design to move the water um, kind of around and onto this ridge so that we were moving water into the gardens and actually um, holding water in the gardens and trying to increase the capacity of the land to hold water. Um, what we found on our on our clay, which is really heavy, there isn't a lot of topsoil, is that um, the the water would just run like a river, and you'd think it was really wet and it'd be slimy on top, but actually ten centimeters down, there was very little penetration um, into the soil. So we really wanted to kind of move water and have that kind of slowing it down, sinking it in, um, and obviously with. Uh, trying to increase organic matter in the soil and, and the, the capacity of the land to kind of hold water and to and to weather those that drought um, waterlogging pattern. Um, it, it felt when we started that our land went from slime to kind of solid bricks within a matter of days. So it was really, it was kind of hard work uh, to begin with, but much better, much better now. Yeah, so here's Dan and the wheelbarrows. Um, yeah, we do have um, stone tracks, so we basically dug out the wheelings and um, the stones. So we've got hard tracks running through most of the garden, which in, in terms of being on foot a lot of the time, um, if you can limit mud and limit um, the sort of terrain that you're walking through, actually, it makes a big difference in terms of sort of how tiring moving through the gardens can be. Yeah, so saying about water management, so this is the track that comes down the side of the polytunnel. So you can see to the left-hand side, we put in a fruiting hedgerow. Um, we decided that we didn't really have enough space to put in an orchard area as such. And also in Somerset, there's a lot of um, disused orchards, abandoned orchards, um, that um, we, we're actually able to go and pick sort of top fruit fairly easily. So we've got good access to top fruit, but we thought it'd be nice to have some productive hedgerows, edible hedgerows. And then on the uphill side of this hedgerow, there is also a drainage ditch. So the idea is that this field, this piece of grazing sort of drains into this field and then that water is held and moved along um, towards the middle of the gardens rather than running down sort of through the polytunnels and out the, the way that it, it, um, it was naturally moving when we arrived on site. But yeah, water movement has been a big kind of design driver definitely in, um, in how we've laid things out. Um, so this is the same track back in the summer. You can see we've put in the, the stone tracks now and it's all the hedges kind of growing up and looking quite quite nice and wild, it's a nice habitat. Yeah, so the other thing that we put in and in terms of wildlife probably makes the biggest difference on the land um, is the reservoir. Um, so I sort of mentioned that we're we're totally off grid. So we do have a reen, which is a Somerset drainage channel that runs along the bottom of the uh, along the north side of the site, um, and we we pump up from that reen into the reservoir um, to keep the reservoir maintained throughout the summer so that the level doesn't drop. Um, it's also quite nice for swimming in in the in the summer if it's really hot. Um, and our irrigation is fed. So irrigation is fed completely from uh, from this pond, from this reservoir, via solar powered pumps. Um, and the gardens are all downhill. So this is actually at the top. This is at the highest point of our land. We pump water up from from the bottom, from the north at the bottom, uh, into the reservoir, and then it's solar powered pumps to to drip pipe irrigation, mostly around the gardens. Um, we get quite a good pressure, it's quite a good pressure. We can run sprinklers and things for new plantings um, if we're direct sowing. Uh, so it, yeah, the system works works pretty well. Uh, yeah, pretty good. And we can also pump from this reservoir up to the top, which is our more, um, our packing barns and things that I'll show you in a bit. Okay, 
so yeah this is back in 2013 when we started um we all of the beds one of the unusual things about the site design at Plotgate is all of the beds are on contour as well um and again this is this is to do with sort of water management and trying to spread the water through through the paths um trying to hold it back trying to allow it to kind of penetrate into into the ground before it runs away and we lose it so again the the beds were all marked out with a, a little laser level um the first garden that we put in we actually sort of dug out we hand dug these paths um and did a lot of it he was very keen on digging in those days not so much now um uh it's not how i advise doing it and, and probably not and not how we've done future gardens um but it means that beds are actually raised so we we're, we're growing on permanent beds that are raised from the level of the path um and yeah so all of the benefits of slightly raised beds um and the contouring evens out the water distribution before we lose it. Um, okay, so that's just a nice picture of the pond. We haven't colonized the pond. We haven't planted it with anything. We've just let it colonize itself. It's got this nice little pond dipping platform. That's good fun. And again, it's that it's that kind of designing your space for people. And it's very much a people uh, scale. Um, system that we're we're kind of operating within uh yeah so this is a uh, this is down at the reen so this is we're we're kind of the last slope before somerset levels proper start so we're we are on uh heavy land and and quite wet land as well um so you can't this is quite overgrown in the summer but um the reen here the drainage ditch is maintained by the river which is about half a mile away um, and this is the solar array that pumps water up to the top. And whenever the sun's shining, the pump comes on and water's continuing to flow up to that reservoir. Um, yeah, this, this picture kind of shows, um, shows our rotation a little bit. We've actually used um, the pigs. So we have pigs that up until this year have lived in the gardens. And they've been our cultivators, so they've actually broken new ground for us. Um, and you can see in the picture on the left, the pigs were in this patch here. And the following year, it's planted up with brassicas and the pigs are on this little triangle. And now this tri that triangle has also been um, turned over into gardens. So we've, we've used pigs to pioneer ground for us. Um, here they are, the lovely creatures. Um, we, have, we have these little cooney coonies. And they're a New Zealand house pig, so they're very friendly. They're not going to bite anyone. Um, and they eat, they've got, they, they can live off a much lower protein diet. So they, um, they eat a lot of veg waste and they're very good at clearing ground, clearing the grass. They dig out roots, they dig out fiscal roots, they dig out dock roots, um, but they don't plough the soil. They've got short noses, so they don't plough the, the soil like a lot of bigger, bigger breeds of pigs would. And they're quite small um, and they're very sweet. And they live outside all year round. So um, the pigs have been great in terms of compost explorers. Yeah, I've got a brief picture here of our, the top of our site. So as well as the bottom field that I showed you the photograph, we have an, an acre strip. Um, and that includes our compost toilets, chicken pens, um, a small garden at the top that's used more for flowers and sort of a social space. Uh, packing bounds, propagation space, and a big composting area as well, and workshops. Um, so we have we have quite a large composting operation. Um, we make compost mixing farmyard manure with wood chips from uh, tree surgeons. So um, some of that's our own, but the vast majority of it is is bought is bought in. Um, this winter we've kind of installed. A uh, drainage system that goes around the composting area. Um, Somerset's quite a nitrogen sensitive um, area because of the levels. Um, and so we wanted to kind of be dealing with, we were noticing that there was quite a lot of leachate coming off the composting area. So that leachate is now collected. And in fact, we recirculate it and pump it back on top of the wood chip um, in the summer months. Um, and then there's a series of drainage ditches that take 
take it round into a little holding pond and we can see that actually the, the water is quite clear by the time it comes out into that little holding pond it's really it's really quite clear so that's that's been a massive improvement last year um, we've got a, quite a large greenhouse for propagation. We've also now got a, a polytunnel that's about the same size as this um, greenhouse. And we've also got a shade house. So this is our main propagation area. Um, some of the early stuff is done. My colleague Jane, who I work with, she tends to have some of it at her house. So she's got a polytunnel at her house as well that she uses for propagation with hot benches and things, things that she wants to have kind of right under her nose because um, propagation's her, her baby, if you like. Uh, veg packing barn, is, it's a very simple pole bound barn structure. It does get quite cold in the winter, um, but it is nice and shady and cool in the summer because uh, it's a bit open and a bit gappy. Um, we've got a couple of these sort of old refrigerated lorry backs for storage, which are great. Um, they tend to be really well insulated. Um, workshop area and again insulated sh shipping container we've actually moved over to storing a lot of our winter crops in the shipping container it's all the workshop space is now outside and that's been cleared out and um it's made a massive difference so that's our dry store um so squashes uh squashes onions um garlic apple juice uh all stored in there and yeah it feels really nice and safe and secure we have had we've had we had a problem last year with squashes and rats getting into um, squash stores, which was a nightmare. So, yeah, storage proper storage has been great. Uh, flower garden, yeah, up at the top, more social space. Um, we, uh, like I say, we're we're kind of hand cultivated on that area, and I think. Um, because of that, we're quite dependent on uh, our trainees, our summer trainees. So we take on four trainees in the summer months. Um, these are three of three of this year's trainees, Hannah, Bex and Chiara. Um, and we also have a lot of um, volunteers who join us for about half a day a week. So um, three days a week, we're open to volunteers. We're always working with volunteers. It's, it's a big part of what we do. Um, and how we manage the gardens. Um, in terms of tools and machinery, um, we've got a Land Rover with a tipper that we use for moving compost around, um, but it doesn't really leave the farm these days. We do have a little Kabuta. Um, that in fact, we've just bought, it's been on loan to us for years and we've just bought it, which is brilliant. Um, and here we are getting the hay in. Um, and other than that, we have uh, a developmental system of um, two person or four person push tools um, that, that Dan enjoys creating. So these are made from bicycles and um, gas bottles and they're kind of bodged together in the workshops, um, but they are really effective and they do allow us to cultivate much bigger areas much more quickly with a little team of people. Um, but most importantly, in terms of hand cultivation, they, they change that movement from hoeing and digging where you're bending over to, um, to a body position where you're actually using your legs and your glutes much more. So it's a much safer position and a much healthier position. And you're not, you're not working kind of on a twist as well. So, um, they're pretty great and I think I've got a little a little picture so yeah sometimes sometimes there's a there's a puller there's a horse on the front as well um so this is the path scraping tool which does a fantastic job and you can whiz up and down the paths and get rid of mostly mostly dandelions in our case oh we've got a little video here so this is the potato ridger in action um so we have two of our nine rotations so we grow half an acre of potatoes each year and obviously by hand, that's quite a large area. Um, we create two ridges with the ridger, we hand plant the potatoes, we mulch heavily on top, and then we use the ridger again to um, earth up. So here's a video of the earther in action.
So you can see not a massive amount of force and as the ground gets, as our ground gets lighter and there's more organic matter in there, this job gets easier and easier. And obviously it's then, it's then just a case of um, going, going down with a fork and pulling that onto the potato plants. But they're, they're really effective and they do make a massive difference and they're quite fun. Um, they're quite fun if you've got a gang in the gardens to, um, to play with some of these tools. So that's great. Right. Um, so I think, oh yeah, and the scythe. Yeah. So Dan is our lawnmower <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, we're, I suppose we're quite into what you might call kind of craft farming um, and the kind of old skills and um, yeah, and, and this kind of spirit of low, uh, low impact invention is, is very much at the heart of what we, what we do here at Plotgate. Um, we have just got a flail mower with the, uh, with the tractor, so there might not be quite as much scything as there has been. Okay, that's all, that's all I want to say. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, so we're very similar scale to KTAM, but do things in a very different way. Um, yeah, have quite a unique range of tools, but obviously all the, all the regular, we use a lot of hoes, a lot of Swiss hoes and hand tools as well. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. So I think we should open up for some questions if anybody wants to ask us anything. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, and yeah, there's some questions already in the chat. Um, in fact, which I'll just I'll I'll read out. So it's a question from Gareth to Tom. Would it be possible you could share your annual rainfall for the sites and your soil type here in Donegal? Donegal, we have 1600 millimetres of annual rainfall and are on brown podzolic soil texture class is silty loam. But it's nice to see how other sites compare to ours here. Yeah, I, I honestly couldn't say. I don't know what our annual rainfall is. I could look it up. Um, yeah, maybe I should do that and get back to you and let you know because I I've, I've got no idea what our rainfall is. It's probably it's probably similar to yours. It's pretty wet here. And what did you said your? Let me just see what was your soil type. Or actually, maybe you can tell me, Gareth. Where are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll come back and speak it here, Tom. Yeah, in, in Donegal, so we would have like a, we we have a soil texture class of silt, so we're very much a silty loam, but our sort of soil groupage here then would be brown prod, uh, brown podzolic. Okay. So here within sort of Derry, Donegal, in that area, we wouldn't have any, if you call it brown earth or top quality soils, the, the best soil we would have in the area would be this brown podzolic soil, which is a an acidic soil sitting with a high level of iron within it, subject then to glaying and subject then to grey mottling if left if left alone or uncultivated and the, the reason I ask about the rainfall is I've attended many of these very very good sessions and I hear a lot about people who have challenging climates when it comes to rainfall and managing irrigation and managing water and I, and I sometimes do quick searches of the annual rainfall for some of these sites and some of them are very very favourable and that they have far far less rainfall than what we would have here across the sort of the western seaboard of Ireland where we can vary from 1600 millimetres to we have a we have an upland sheep farm and we would have there we would have 2700 millimetres of rain per year which mm. is it's, it's pretty horrific and, and, I, and I hear some of the yourselves across the mainland discussing growing and I think but I would love to have that that level of, of problem where there's only 900 or 1,000 mils or 1,200 mils. I'd love to have that problem. Yeah, I'm just um, I'm, on, I, I'm just trying to look online now to see what a rainfall is. But actually, the soils are very varied. We have we do have some very good quality soils, but that particular site where we are in Ilston is probably quite similar to yours because we do have um, there's areas of the site that haven't been cultivated probably for 30, 40 years. And there is glaying, you know, there's that that grey blue mottling of a lot of the soil there. So I think those soils are definitely similar and subject. Um, but I don't I, don't, I keep looking online and see, or do you know somewhere to find Swansea Gower rainfall, annual rainfall? I was just looking and none of them were saying specifically. But I would say overall that um, it is a real issue, like rainfall and waterlogging does mm. make things a lot. There's a lot you can... There's a lot of different elements of a site you can deal with. 
but I think a site that is very wet is like, you know, it's it's drainage is a is a big is a big investment of time and energy. It's also something that needs ongoing management. But similar with Amy, you know, I'm sure you've got, you know, you've got big issues with managing water around your site. Yeah, and also, I mean, I think I'd add that like um, that changing climate is just making it more more and more of an issue for more and more people being able to cope with the kind of deluges of floods and then and then drought conditions in the summer, which we've all experienced over the last few years. So um, I just think water's an, an increasing issue for every, for anyone who's growing. <laughs> I just wanted to, I've just found, Tom, it's 1,100 millimetres on the 1,100. Gallery. Nothing. Um, <laughs> you no, know, that's, that sounds all right, doesn't it, compared to you, Gareth? And then uh, Gareth also had a question for you, Amy, which was how are you filtering and treating the reservoir water before using as irrigation? Okay, well, we, we, we filter it through um, particle filters um, for irrigation, but we don't... Um, we don't treat it in, a, in any other way. It has been, and our it, because we're drip feeding, we're not we're not um, sprinklers. There's no sprinklers in the polytunnels, so we're not watering directly on, onto salad plants and things. So our environmental health chap was happy with that because we're only drip feeding onto the soil, uh, drip watering onto the soil. Um, it was suggested to us that UV filtering before, particularly in the polytunnels, I think. Um, I think outdoors, uh, it doesn't matter so much, but I think in polytunnels, you can get viruses and things building up um, through untreated water, but we haven't, we haven't gone down that route because we haven't really encountered very much of a problem, to be honest. Um, we do, so, the, so water from the reservoir can also be pumped up to the top here um, if we run out of water, but mostly we're reliant on rainwater at the top here. And the rainwater does go through a three-stage filtration process and then through a UV filter um, before it comes out the taps. So we we don't we haven't had it tested since we've installed the rainwater the rainwater system. So um, we don't offer it to people as drinking water. Um, but personally, I do put it in the kettles and boil it, and um, and and kind of I'm 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 happy that it's uh, it's reasonably good. But it's good enough for coming out of taps and. Um, and washing hands and things with. Um, but I suppose the other thing is that we don't have a processing license, so we don't wash any of the veg before it goes out. So because we don't have mains water and we don't have yearly um, water tests <clears throat> carried out at the moment on site. Um, so we're not processing any veg, washing it at all. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Good question. Um, but yeah, I would. I, it has been advised to us that UV filtering before um, irrigating tunnels is a good idea, and it is something we're looking into. But you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> There's another question from Sky for you, Amy, which was: Can you tell us more about using pigs to clear ground? Are they better than other animals to do this? How long do they need to be on there? Also, what is the breed you use again, and are there other breeds that can be used? Okay, I love having pigs in the gardens. Um, I just think they're great. <laughs> um, they're fantastic composters. They, you know, all of the waste that comes off the gardens, brassica stalks, everything, we just throw it all to the pigs um, and they, they munch their way through it. Dandelions, they love dandelions. They love weeds. <laughs> they eat it all. Um, they're supposed to be good for clearing things like leather jackets and wireworm and as well um, in terms of turning ground over from pasture um, but I, I haven't somebody said that to me and I haven't actually checked it out in terms of sourced it source where that information comes from properly but um, we have found certainly the gardens that we didn't use the pigs on we had a lot more problems with leather jackets and wireworms than we have gardens that we have used the pigs on so anecdotally I'd say our kind of experience supports that. Um, we the the pigs that we have, the little ginger hairy things, are cooney coonies. Um, they're a New Zealand house pig with short noses, so they don't plow the soil. Like if you, I've I've been to see friends who keep pigs, and and in the winter you've got sort of a foot of mud, um, and they don't really do that because they can't they can't dig underneath and turn over the soil. So they'll dig down roots and they and they take off the turf, um, but they don't they don't plough like a lot of pigs do. 
um and they're they're, a, they're not a commercial pig you're not going to make you're not get not going to make any money out of cooney cooney sausages um they have very high fat content they're very slow growing but they eat a very low um protein ration so you can feed them i mean some people say they feed them exclusively on veg veg waste and they do fine our experience has been that we do give them a grain ration um as well but much smaller than you would in a commercial pig sitting so they're, they're not there they're not a commercial not a commercial pig but they are great to have in the gardens and um yeah they're really sweet uh yeah no you know nobody's ever been bitten by them kids get in there and try and sit on them and they they just don't they're not bothered at all um and that's that's a massive plus for us yep so i like pigs uh, Reese has just asked a question, which was asked to Amy, but I guess might be interesting to hear from both of you, which is what soil changes have you noticed over the life of the plot throughout the years, specifically during abnormally hot or wet weather? Whew. <laughs> um, I, I suppose, I mean, we, we started cultivating the, the land here in 2013. So we're into our ninth, ninth year. Is that right? 13, 14, 15, eighth year, eighth, eighth year of cultivation. Um, and the biggest thing for us has been the organic matter content on our on our heavy clay and just lightening, lightening the soil, but also kind of increasing that weather window between um, uh, the clay turning from, you know, that kind of slime to brick, um, that quick transition that you get from slime to brick on heavy clay. So the big thing for us has been about organic matter and to be honest that's the reason we've ended up as a as a kind of no dig um surface mulch uh with a surface mulch system that's not how we set out in the first place we didn't say oh we want to be no dig um we, we were kind of tied to the idea of hand cultivation but it's just been surface mulching for us has been um the best way of retaining moisture managing weeds and improving soil structure um uh, what was the question again? Uh, it was about <laughs> soil improvements. Yeah, no, what, what changes have you noticed over the life of the plot? What soil changes have you noticed over the life of the plot, specifically during abnormally hot or wet weather? Yeah, so um, 2019, I think we had the big, the big droughts and we did, I mean, we had, we had sort of four inch cracks, um, particularly down the path areas. Um, um, but again, that's it's in those sort of conditions where surface mulching has been really kind of invaluable in terms of um, mo moisture retention and um, uh, limiting the amount of uh, the amount of use that we've had to make of irrigation because obviously our, our water is limited by um, by you know the complexity of our system. It's quite a, it's quite a simple system and we can't just turn the taps on and and keep it running. So um, yeah. That's, I think that's answered it. Tom, do you want to add anything to that about what you, soil changes you've noticed? I would say the main changes, we've got two quite different sites, like I illustrated earlier, like the sort of the clay heavy site and then the, the lighter site with very much better quality soil, higher fertility. Um, and on both sites, we noticed like quite a drastic drop within from first year is so incredibly fertile. The, the crops are just incredible the first year and very few pests or any sort of problem whatsoever. And that definitely deteriorated year two, year three. Um, but I would say year four, year five, year six, it feels like it gradually has been creeping up again. And year this year into year seven, I feel like we're back somewhere close, not as good as the first year we cultivated, but getting back to actually that level of of fertility and health in the soil. Um, I was just thinking the polytunnels have always been no dig and yeah, they are incredibly, seven years in now, they're incredibly productive and require very little addition of, um, you know, we compost them every year, but it seems like we don't need to give much of a surface mulch and actually the crops just remain incredibly healthy in there. Um, yeah, I'd say that's the, the main differences. Thanks. And there's a, there's a couple of questions here. Um, I'm going to ask one from Sky just because it sort of ties into the soil stuff, which is to Amy, do you experience surface runoff during heavy rains on your no dig beds as they're on contour to the hill slope? Um, no, 
we don't we don't know i mean the contouring of the beds is specifically for to avoid sort of surface runoff so um what what we observed when we first came onto the site was was literally a river running over the surface um down the slope and the contouring of the beds basically means you can see the water sitting at the top of the gardens in the in the top three or four paths and actually as that rain stops and clears you can see that water moving down the gardens down that path and, and the paths because they are quite accurately on contour the water spreads i mean you, you can see which of the accurate beds are which are slightly more sketchy because when water's sitting in them you can see where it sits but it but year on year um the water drains quicker and quicker um and that's been a really amazing thing to see is that you know the first winter that we we had these contour beds and there was water sitting in the paths for like weeks i was kind of like oh can't we just get rid of it this is <laughs> this is a bit nerve-wracking but we we don't get that yeah after a heavy deluge we've got water in the paths and it and it clears it moves down the gardens and it clears and um and so i do think that's kind of testament to to the kind of system um yeah so no very little surface runoff it's very gradual we're holding it all back um i'm i'm just going to jump in with a question for both of you which is um there's quite a lot of talk about share land sharing and land sparing and have you both or either of you actively done things in your site plan to kind of enhance or increase biodiversity and habitats and what and have you noticed a change in that over the life of your PSAs? Yeah I could say um, well the, the field down in Ilston is naturally a much more biodiverse and wilder field and we've definitely left a lot of very wild areas and we've got three decent sized ponds down there um, and yet it just being around that diversity and seeing all the wildlife there is a great benefit. I don't know. I'm sure it does have impacts on the cropping and has sort of knock on impacts sort of um, for wildlife feeding on pests within within the field system. Um, the other site we haven't It's kind of a more recently taken on site. We've been there four years and it's kind of it's a fairly um, fairly mechanized and fairly open site at the moment. But we've just been we've just been given the go ahead for creating this food forest around the whole site. So we're not entirely sure how that's going to work yet. But our plan would be we're thinking of a kind of agroforestry system, but we don't know. It kind of depends on the the funders and how they want to develop the site with us. Um, but we're definitely looking at getting a lot more tree crops and nut crops in there and just breaking up the site visually, breaking down the wind allowing more habitat for other species so that's something we're definitely looking to move towards more on both sides and also within that I'd say we notice over the years that um, as we're more established that we notice like the areas where we're not very efficient in our cropping and I think there's areas of the land we could be using for more for biodiversity and getting more crops out of smaller areas of ground so we kind of looking to move more towards that. Yeah um yeah, I didn't really point it out. We've, we've got a kind of half acre down in the north part at the bottom of the slope that is, um, I mean, we just called it, call it the wilderness and that's just a kind of left area of scrub. Um, and again, all of our hedgerows, we, we don't, we, we manage them by kind of thinning, thinning out some of the sort of standards, particularly the elm that kind of dies. Um, but our hedgerows don't really look like hedgerows anymore. They look like kind of little forest corridors, which is, um, which is really nice and I just I think if you're if you're operating within an organic system you have to you have to create spaces for your for things to be living and for, for, for kind of predator populations to be kind of surviving um and the pond the pond is massive um the the life on the pond the kind of dragonflies the bats in the evenings like um yeah the pond's immense in terms of um um invertebrate life uh, particularly um, but yeah, big, big bushy hedgerows, you know, you've just got these corridors, these flight corridors that, you know, we see the bats moving, moving down them and um, yeah, it's great. Thank you. And then there's a question here from Gareth. Uh, what tools would Tom and Amy like to add to their toolboxes over the coming few years and which tool is their current favourite or most important? Um, I would say for us, you know, we're kind of more straightforward in our 
you know what we've got in our tool shed to what they've got <laughs> and block gate but um it, it kind of between um hand tools and machinery tools i i would say for us the oscillating holes the hose the swiss oscillating hose are like our our most used tool i mean after the fork probably for harvesting but actually sort of for crop management the swiss oscillating hose are a pleasure to use and really effective um so we've got lots of those and it's nice to be working in the field with a whole team of people hoeing at the same time and machinery wise i feel like actually there's a lot of our machinery that needs kind of updating and working with um but personally i love i love the potato planter as far as like mechanical tools go it's just a really sociable bit of kit and you're like a team of three people it's got a really rhythmical old sort of clicking noise and it just runs really slowly um and it's just it's only like a couple of days a year we plant potatoes but i think we all kind of look forward to like it's just a sort of a nice sit down job so yeah i think those would be my two yeah interesting yeah we use um hose a lot of those the swiss oscillating hose are absolutely brilliant um uh i think in terms of the next the next tool that uh dan's going to be sorting out in the workshop um we could do with some sort of mulch mulching tool uh, it's probably not a muck spreader or it's a muck spreader with a hood that directs it down so some sort of mulching tool we do spend a lot of time wheelbarrowing um wheelbarrowing compost off the back of land rover and i think that would be the thing that would save us a massive amount of time and energy but wheelbarrowing mulch and mulching beds is a really accessible job and for volunteers who really want a day on the farm being physical and um uh yeah and kind of feeling that in their bodies um wheelbarrowing is fantastic and you can't get it wrong so um but for me i've, I've had enough of wheelbarrowing <laughs> I'd, I'd quite like some sort of yeah some sort of easy contraction that just lays it down like a carpet <laughs> over the bed like that <laughs> Um, and I do think that our, the flail mower that's come with the tractor that we've just bought will get used. Um, we've got quite a lot of grassy areas and siding's great, um, but it's quite hard work. Uh, <laughs> so I think the flail mower and uh, the, 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 the mulch layer um, are going to be tools for the future. I think we've probably got time for one more question. There's none in the chat. Has anyone, does anyone want to ask anything else? Unmute yourself I've, I've got that. a question for Joe actually, because Joe's Joe is the pig woman. Um, and I wondered if Joe, if Joe had to recommend um a pig, a pig breed for um integrating into the small holding system. Obviously not the Cooney Cunies, because I've talked about them and you they're probably not very popular with you. But what would you what would you go for? <laughs> well, I've got um, I've actually got Uni Cooney crosses and they are oh. absolutely lovely. Um, I'm trying to recreate Suffolk used to have their own breed of pig, so I'm actually busily um, back breeding all sorts of uh, native pigs. The most destructive are the longer nosed pigs, um, but I've got some middle white that. So they've got, they look like they've walked into the back end of a bus. Um, and they're lovely, absolutely, and very sweet natured as well. Um, and they do the job just quite nicely. But if you're going to go for a pedigree pig, I'd go for a shorter nosed pig if you don't want them to dig down too deep. Our land is, oh, had been neglected for 10 years. So it's full of docks and thistles, and, but they've been absolutely amazing. And we put ours on for a year and then move them to the next place. So they get a whole year cycle on, on the plot and then we move them on to the next one. What I've been doing is putting that down to lay back grazing for, because we're uh, grazing the horses and the sheep currently on the wild flat, on the meadow so that we have a wild flower meadow instead of perennial ryegrass, which is what we planted before. Um, but obviously we'll have to take them off in March, so we need some layback grazing. So that's what the pigs have been doing at the moment. But as we progress, they'll um they'll they'll we'll get the shorter nosed ones. I think I'll take that top tip from you. So I hope that helps. 
Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah. And I think I think uh, we we inherited our Cooney Coonies and I think they are crosses, actually, because I've seen people's purebred Coonies and um, ours are a little bit um, less, less pot bellied than than um, than some some purebred Cooney Coonies. So yeah, I think ours, ours may be crosses. We've got about 100 tons of potatoes for our pigs this year, and that's what they've had consistently. Um, since about September, and they are just the fattest pigs you've ever seen. They really <laughs> are. Very happy, fat pigs, but they are the fattest pigs ever. <laughs> so, so I think we'll we'll finish in a couple of minutes. I've got a, a last question for Tom and Amy, which is, uh, if you were starting again, what would be your kind of biggest piece of advice in terms of thinking about site planning from the perspective of being almost 10 years on both of you i could i can go if you like tom yeah go on <laughs> um in terms of site planning i uh i think one of one of the things that i wish we'd done um fertility building i think is a massive thing um and it's something that maybe we didn't think about enough at the beginning um so it's like how how are you building fertility and like uh, developing our composting system has been a big thing and, and that's been something that we've really had to kind of like oh we need compost oh no we need a lot of compost where are we going to get that from we can't we're not going to buy it in that's that's too expensive like we've got to um and in a sense that's why we've got the tractor that's how we've ended up with the tractor because we need to make lots of compost um uh, and the other thing that i would do is that if we're laying tracks um, we always now put um, a, a, some land drain in with a piece of string. So if we want to run electric pipes, water pipes or anything through that track at a later date, um, we can we can thread it. We can thread it through um, some of the tracks that we put down in the early days. We didn't put land drain through. Um, and now we've got pipes running over the ground and it's just like, oh, that's messy. Why that could be sunk really easily. So that would be another top tip. Ooh. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I was just going to say on the back of that, we are uh, doing a webinar tonight at seven o'clock with Nikki Grady Scott uh, on composting. So if anyone wants to hear about composting, join us. I put the link in the chat. Tom, do you want to end with your top tip for starting out? Yeah, I would say as far as like site layout and scaling up and yeah, starting out, um, if you can just really kind of take your time and go and go and visit lots of other sites, talk to lots of people. And if you can get people to come and visit your site and just, just take your time to get to know the space and, and really think and double think and have discussions with people about how you're going to lay it all out. Um, yeah, I think, I think, that, I mean, for us, I think the main thing that I would have liked to have had more of my head around from the start was developing more, of an agroforestry style system and building in the whole sort of biodiversity element of it, fruit and nut tree element of it right from the beginning, rather than just going ahead with everything and then trying to look at how to integrate that later. So yeah, taking time to think about it and have lots of discussions with different people about how it might look. Can I can I just answer Reese's question? So Reese has got a question that says, um, what's everyone's favorite fruit or vegetable to eat or grow? And uh, squashes squashes at this time of the year it's like all that summer sunshine that's stored mm. in those that beautiful golden flesh I'm just like oh I, I'm just squashes every day <laughs> I was thinking exactly the same and it's so little work to grow them and they're so little impact on the ground they're just like yeah yeah they're great yeah I'm gonna retire and be a squash farmer <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much, everybody listening. And uh, thank you, Amy and Tom, for sharing all your knowledge and experience and expertise. Um, and I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers.